are going to take our cue from the live feed people, so okay. we have to be prepared. That's your cue. Uh, okay, here we go. Uh, welcome, everyone. I, Norman Frisch, I'm going to be moderating this session. I have absolutely nothing to do with the history that we are presenting, which is probably what qualifies me to, it, it was a guarantee that I wouldn't jump in with any stories on top of, you know, the hundred stories you're going to hear in the next 75 minutes. Um, we are live streaming this event uh, via HowlRound TV. <laughs> And if there are people who are up at 9.15 in the morning or 6.15 West Coast time who are watching this live, they have an ability to uh, text us questions and comments. So towards the end of the session, um, when we open up to questions, we, in addition to your questions, we will take some questions from the virtual audience. Um, I'm going to remind everybody, as we do at every session, to please uh, turn off your phones. Um, or if you're using your phone, which you were encouraged to do during the session, please be sure that the ringers are silenced. And, um, and lastly, I'm going to ask when we do get to the, I'll remind you, but when we do get to the Q&As, um, I'm, I'm going to ask you to identify yourself when you stand up and present your question, just so that we have a kind of record, uh, you know, a, a transcript of who asked what and, um, and so on. So um, here we are. Um, Ellen Lauren at the end of the table. Sandy Robbins and, <laughs> and Tom Hewitt. Uh, I'm not going to read their biographies. They're printed in your programs, and because they're so extensive, that would really cut into our time. Um, what I've done is to um, take a long list of questions that we hoped to address in this session I've distilled them down into three kind of question clumps, um, and I'm gonna address them to the panelists and ask them each to respond in turn. The first uh, really, the, let me say the uh, symposium has been organized in a sense chronologically. <laughs> so what we're looking at this morning are the first contacts between uh, American actors and teachers and uh, the Scott Company and Suzuki and his work and the training as it was developing uh, in Japan and then the training as it began developing over here. So my first question to each of you is, how did that first encounter for you take place? Who led you there? What did you make of it when, when you first arrived? And what, what, happened, what happened inside you uh, as a result of that first contact? <coughs> um, Ellen, to give some context, um, Ellen has been soliciting <coughs> histories from various people who couldn't be here this weekend. Um, and we thought we would read one, which kind of gives a kind of historical framework for how some of this exchange was first set up. Ellen? Uh, yes. Um, this is an open letter from Tonin Sarah O'Connor who was formerly Sarah O'Connor. Um, she is now, her official title, the resident priest emerita of the Milwaukee Zen Center. So she ran the 
Milwaukee Zen Center for many, many years, after being a, a remarkable force in the regional theater scene, and in particular at the Milwaukee Rep, where I met her, and uh, was instrumental in this first bridge, and she wrote this beautiful letter, and we decided we would read it to you. Um, an open letter from Tonin Sarah O'Connor. This is my response to a request to write a personal message to honor the occasion of City's 25th anniversary by, at Skidmore by relating what I remember of Scott and Tadashi Suzuki's extraordinary creative vision. When I think of Tadashi Suzuki, I don't think of his international renown nor his justly earned fame. I think of the first time I heard feet pounding the floor in a rhythm that resounded like a pounding heart. I was standing in the auditorium of the University of Wisconsin Milwaukee's theater as Suzuki's company moved across the stage in a rehearsal for that night's performance of the Trojan Women. I only saw a rehearsal of one of Anne Bogart's pieces because I was waiting to meet with Ellen Lauren, a friend from her early days with the Milwaukee Repertory Theater. Here too was a unique vision of movement, silence, and speech that had reached inside and touched something primitive. So this is a celebration of these artists' years of brilliant creativity, yet for me personally, it evokes memories of people Without people and their relationships, the history would have been vastly different. That the Milwaukee Repertory Theater and the theater department of UWM, University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, were the first to present Tadashi Suzuki's company in the US was the result of these friendships. It begins with two people, Frank Tenney and Martha Cognier, with a little help from Kazuto Ohira. John Dillon, artistic director of the Rep, planned to present a translation of Kobo Abe's Friends and hoped to meet with the author. I found a notice in the Theater Communications Group, TCG, newsletter announcing the formation of the Japan-US Friendship Commission and my friendship with Frank Tenney began. <laughs> Frank was one of the generation of Americans who had encountered Japan after World War II and fallen in love with it. Frank was no bureaucrat and a man who seriously desired to see cultural communication between our two nations. He readily funded an exploratory trip to see contemporary Japanese theater about which we knew zip. But we were told by folks in the State Department, Japanese society was nearly impenetrable and we'd get nowhere. This is when I turned to Martha Cognier, director of the International Theater Institute. Martha put me in touch with Kazuto Ohira Toho's representative in New York, buying the rights to Broadway <laughs> musicals. Mr. Ohira was delighted that we were curious beyond Kabuki and No, and he made calls and wrote letters and that sent doors flying open. I was among those who made that trip, although I did not encounter Suzuki's work at that time. However, Sandy Robbins, head of the theater department program at UWM, did. The upshot of it all was that when Martha called with a frantic message that the Wasada Shokekijo's first appearance in the US had been canceled at the last moment, I called Sandy. He was enthusiastic, and thus we became the first to bring this amazing company to the US. It was on this occasion that I met another person who must be remembered and honored, Ikuko Saito one of the founders of Scott and its executive director of, for many years. All the explosive creativity was quietly and wisely <laughs> enabled by this remarkable woman. Over the years, we became friends of a sort, and one of the only pieces of jewelry I retained when I became a Zen priest is a medallion of Polish amber that she gave me, a memento of the company's tour to Poland. Frank Tenney continued to offer support funding a six-week trip to the U.S. for Suzuki so that he could observe American theater and a trip to the company's new home in Togomura that included Jewel Walker himself, an accomplished movement artist, as well as students of his who later became part of Suzuki's production of The Tale of Lear, a deconstruction and reassembly of the Shakespeare play within his own unique style. We have John Dillon's courage to thank for the American version of The Tale of Lear, a style of performance unknown to our Milwaukee audience. 
And the production eventually was performed at Toromura, and I learned a lot about obtaining visas for American actors in Japan. <laughs> <laughs> so when I think about this story, I remember connections, trust, and hard work among a group of people dedicated to the support of creativity and international exchange. John Dillon, Martha Cognier, Kazuto Ohira, Frank Tenney, Sanford Robbins. I think of creative minds, Tadashi Suzuki and Anne Bogart. I think of actors who gave their talent to the productions, Kaioko Shiraishi, Tom Hewitt, Ellen Lawrence. For me, this is a story of human connections and determination. I hope similar artistic friendships will carry us into the future despite the barriers raised today by growing nationalism and political extremism. Artists and those who support them must persevere and <coughs> reach out to one another. Thank you for the opportunity to set down these thoughts. Conan Sarah O'Connor, former managing director of the Milwaukee Repertory Theater, Greece, Emirata, Milwaukee Zen Center. <laughs> I, before we jump in, I should just mention that uh, the members of City Company have been soliciting such memories and oral histories from uh, people of that early generation of contact. And a lot of that material is in the archive room that is here on campus in the building across the way. So for those of us who are lucky enough to be here this weekend, um, there is a lot of that material on paper, on video, that you can spend time with around and between your other sessions. Um, so if we're uh, responding kind of chronologically, um, Sandy, were you really at this table the first point of contact? Yes. Yeah, I was. Uh, but, and I'll tell you about it. I'm going to just take two moments to say something else. And uh, I won't say how moved and honored I am to be part of this. And that the context of it is for me one of the extraordinary accomplishments in the American theater, the city company's 25 years. It is such a remarkable thing that a group of artists have stayed together for that length of time and created work after work. And this conversation and this opportunity wouldn't be possible were it not for that remarkable accomplishment. And I am honored to be uh, here in the presence of such an extraordinary gift to the entire American theater and the world theater. My hat is off to and Bogart and her colleagues. It's just a remarkable thing. Uh, so, what, what Sarah said is so, I, she, Sarah was one of those driving forces, uh, managing directors without whom there would be no Lord Theaters. And uh, she called one day and said, would you like to go to Japan? And before she'd finished the second syllable, I had said yes. <laughs> and, uh, and she said, what would you do there? And I s said that I would like to study the training of Kabuki and No and Bunraku. <laughs> uh, and, 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 and see as much of that as I could in a three week period. <clears throat> Knowing that that would introduce me to the surface of the surface of the surface, but it was sure a lot more than I would have found out otherwise. And uh, so I, I went there, it was on my honeymoon actually, and uh, it was a great way to celebrate a marriage really. And we were the guests of uh, the Japan American Friendship Society, which had been put together with reparations money after the war. And uh, anyhow, I, I did get to spend time with the masters of those three disciplines. And, it was a life-altering experience. My host was a man from the Japan Foundation named Tomozo Yano. And Yano, uh, I would ask every day, there, with this great tradition, there must be a contemporary avant-garde theater in response to this, because that is how it works. And he said, oh, no, no, no. 
he was, you understand, a functionary of that organization. He said, no, 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 uh, hardly anything at all. And about the Bunraku. <laughs> and uh, this, this persisted for the first two weeks of my visit. And it was an extraordinary visit, so I had no complaints, but I was really committed to discover as best I could what was happening in the contemporary theater. So finally, I, I devised a plot. My wife and I took Yanosan out for drinks after, uh, after a day watching the fight master at the Kubukuza. And uh, I got a very large bottle of sake, and I kept pouring it with each shot. We'd say, Kampai, and I would say, where is the contemporary? <laughs> and he would say, oh, no, 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 no. And I'd say, good. And, and about seven-eighths of the bottle down, he said, well, there's something, I think, great, in, but it's in uh, Wasida. And I said, good, can we go there tomorrow? And he was just drunk enough to assent and, and just uh, honorable enough to honor his drunken assent. <laughs> and uh, so we, we went there and we went to this, I, I should say, I think memory is a completely unreliable, <laughs> duplicitous uh, device that the survival mechanism put together to make us think we're a person with qualities and stakes. <laughs> and I, I, I don't trust it. And I work very, very hard to do violence to the idea that I'm a thing with properties. <laughs> All that said, here's my recollection. We, we, we went to this warehouse and on either the second or third floor of this uh, warehouse, we walked in and there was uh, what you all recognize as this training. It, it, they were on a short break and I sat down and when I stood up, my life was different uh, an hour and a half later. You asked how it affected me and I, I, I'm unable to express that. I can tell you that it was like coming home in one way. It was something, you know, sometimes you find something you didn't know you were searching for. And that was my experience. I had been devoted to the idea of some balance to the bastardized Stanislavskian approach that was so pervasive you couldn't breathe anything else. And here it was in a kind of glory that made the plays I most loved possible. And so that was my first encounter. Tom, we, when um, Sarah's letter was being read, I turned to you on the point because there was a there was a reference to the kind of the precise point in time where you entered the picture. Is that right? <laughs> there was. Uh, I entered the picture as a student at UWM, uh, the program that Sandy Sandy founded at uh, in, in Milwaukee. Uh, we were in the middle of our second year of a three-year program. Uh, I believe it was 1979 or, or 80. Uh, so uh, the program was uh, with a classical emphasis, a very physical program, uh, f uh, a lot of uh, movement and uh, vocal training. I recall at the time, uh, we knew that Mr. Suzuki was coming with three of his actors, we were going to do this, this training method. At the time, we were being rolfed, uh, deep tissue <laughs> massage, rolfing. You know, and, and the rolfer was using my pictures, before and after pictures, as great success. I was getting great results from rolfing and, you know, uh, feeling sort of loose and, you know, uh, hips are part of torso and I'm leaning all this kind of, like a thing up my nose and it was remarkable. And I remember feeling so resentful to have to go into the next room and do what seemed to me uh, j uh, character walks to Japanese elevator music. I found no, no, how could this possibly apply to anything I was ever going to do ever in my life. My, phys my physiognomy, my physical makeup was not at all conducive to the physical training. I have a short torso, relatively long legs. I felt clumsy. Mr. Suzuki would often point me out, look at spider legs here, and, like don't do it like Tom. Then, after we did those physical exercises for a while, we started incorporating a scene from the Bakai, or no, Trojan we, Women. Well, so it's not, we were doing scenes from Medley the Trojan Women Hill. with Mr. Suzuki's <laughs> actors. We would speak in English and they would respond to us in, in Japanese and Mr. Suzuki would, you know, was Mr. Suzuki with them and they were 
remarkable, blew us off the stage every time, and at that moment I knew I wanted what they had. Something, well, I had never seen anything like that before in my life, and I wanted it. Myself, an uh, actor named John Rensenhaus, Jewel Walker, Marge Walker, uh, the late Larry Shue, wonderful playwright and actor, um, Sharon Ott, and John Dillon, we traveled to Japan and uh, trained with Mr. Suzuki's company for the summer. And then things got really awesome because I got to see the company in context. I got to see the entire company perform and train and that was a very transformative thing. We then worked on uh, we worked on a production of The Bakai that was going to be a bilingual production with members of Mr. Suzuki's company and students at UWM. So we rehearsed that. We came back the next year. We did a fully mounted production at the university uh, with the, the biracial, bilingual cast. And then the next summer, returned to Toga, performed in Toga and in, uh, uh, in Tokyo. And that started for what was me, for me was to be a 13 year relationship with Mr. Suzuki. I have performed periodically uh, with his company uh, during that time in productions of The Bakai, a piece he called Clytemnestra, and The Tale of Lear, which I did with the Japanese company, and also an all-American, all-male cast. Uh, so um, that was remarkable. I, I uh, you know, um, I recall Mr. Suzuki saying several times, using the phrase, you need to be fictional on the stage, and I, that really captured my imagination. He would say things like, in the early days before e Leon Ingalls Rude, translation was a very academic, so we would have, I would get direction like, okay, Tom, as you rise, please try to stop the rotation of the earth. So, okay, 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 okay. So, so, you know, things like that, where they were, they were really powerful. I was also, at the time, I became a member of uh, uh, Arena, the company uh, Arena Stage in Washington, D.C. Um, so I was performing back and forth. I would go to Japan or, you know, Greece or wherever you go with Mr. Suzuki. And then I'd come back to the United States and do, you know, uh, The Crucible or, you know, The Man Who Came to Dinner. Now, Arena Stage is an, is an arena with all, all four sides. So I was really having to shift my sensibilities back and forth, which was challenging and kind of wonderful at the same time. Mr. <laughs> Suzuki allows, there's a lot of power in being still with Mr. Suzuki. And so that was very uh, beneficial for me at, at the arena stage. Um, but there were things like, uh, when you work with Mr. Suzuki, there's a wonderful thing, like he will give you a ground plan, basically, back in my day anyway. You come on, come, you know, both actors come from the side of the stage, you circle each other, you stop, you continue the circle, and you leave the circle. That was sort of the ground plan. And then you're sort of left on your own. You get like, you know, informal rehearsals with the company, and they were, they were just really wonderful. So you rehearsed, uh, you rehearsed that way, and then there were formal rehearsals with Mr. Suzuki. So you really, you know, really solid on your material and what you're doing, basically giving him a performance from the first, from the get-go. So I sort of adapted that method of working, and so I would show up to the first day of rehearsal of like, you know, um, uh, uh, oh, what's that, measure for measure, with my lines learned, and you know, there's the Duke, and I'm Lucio, and so, and I, you know, I learned my lines, and I sort of made a ground plan, and the, and the first day of rehearsal, and I did it, and the director was like, well, that's pretty good, let's, let's move on, and the guy playing the Duke was like, like he came up to me afterwards and said, you know, that was great, but, you know, we, we could have worked on that together. <laughs> we could have developed that together, and I was like, oh, okay, okay, all right. So, so, you know, there are little sort of challenges like that for me. Um, so I have, uh, oh, my time's up, so maybe I'll get a question no, no, later take on. take my time. Oh, no, no, I can't, I can't, yeah. Uh, so my, okay, I'll make it really quick. I'll make it really quick. So uh, I, I, as far as g giving context to the work in America, you know, I, I, I was such a young actor, and it was such a part of my develop. I was, you know, 21, 22 years old when I first met so he was a became a really, really important part of my life, and, and, and I cannot separate most, what I can't separate. It's just part of me. I know that uh, I use it specifically on occasions. I know that it shaped my career. This whole idea of being fictitious on the stage, I play, I've never been, I don't like, I'm not drawn to naturalism. I play like evil lions and Dracula and uh, alien transvestites. <laughs> And I love that, I love that sort of being other, being fictitious on the stage. I love that idea, and it shaped my career. It's allowed me to work with Anne 
And uh, I remember, I have to tell a quick story about, I was doing Frankenfurter and the Rocky Horror Show. Mr. Suzuki came to see the show. He came, he came backstage after the show. Is and this in Japan? No, it's in no, Broadway. 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 And so I, he's come backstage, he's got like the, the, the participation kits, he's wearing a little feather boa. And, like, and I got to say to him, you know, never in my life have I ever used the specifics of the Suzuki training more than I have playing this role. I'm in the high heels, and with Suzuki, you know, you're, you got the feet and legs are the primary focus. So I'm like right away feeling kind of at home with this, and, like my being expressive with my feet and legs. And I was like, thank you so much, Mr. Suzuki, because this training is really, really helping me to like. I've never used this since, and how ironic that I'm playing an alien transvestite. And so the proudest moment of my life is when Mr. Suzuki, in an article for American Theater Magazine, cited me as, now there's a smart American actor using my training playing an alien transvestite. It was like, <laughs> the proudest moment of my life. because usually Ellen is the hardest person to follow. Oh. But right now, she's, been handed, she's in the position that we're all usually in. That was fantastic. I mean, in, in some sense, it was also not only encountering Suzuki and his company, um, it was encountering Tom and Kelly and Bondo and Leon, and we, we, we were just on fire, and training all day, and soaking our feet in the river, and then training again, and then cleaning dorms, and cooking 10,000 eggs every morning for everybody, <laughs> and, and it, was, it was the whole value system and the ethos. I was, at the time, a very young actor at the Milwaukee Repertory Theater. I had always been interested in ensemble and company, ended up there, and um, my partner at the time was sent by TCG to go over to Toga, and came back and simply said, that, that's it, you, you gotta go. You just gotta go, you gotta figure out how to get over there next summer. And so I did, with the help of the Friendship Commission and John Dillon, and, and there were people already there, you know, this table is very small, some of them in this room, Kelly, there, Bondo, studying, and I did go over, and I was just absolutely knocked out. And as I said, it, 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 it's, uh, it's the training, yes. It's the fact that you see this company, and they grab your luggage, and then suddenly they're, they're in the office. How'd they get in the office? And it, oh my, oh, they're in the theater rehearsing. How did they, oh, they're up in the flies, yeah. hanging the lights, and wait, wait a minute, you're serving my meal. How did you <laughs> get from, and maybe there's a tool belt under their costume, or, uh, or they're running with, at that time, thermal faxes in their hands <laughs> to Suzuki. Uh, but they did everything, and they did everything with such grace and such friendship, and it was infectious. And then there's the physical environment of Toga, which maybe you saw a little bit of in the films. Um, and some of you perhaps have been there too. So it was, I came from an athletic background. I did not come from any kind of artistic background before I gravitated towards the theater. Um, I had a military upbringing and I was an equestrian. I was a competitive equestrian. And when I got into the theater, it was, it was great fun doing plays and, and, and doing plays <laughs> and feeling and meaning it. And then when I met this training, something in me, the, the fact that I could ask of my body to also become a creative, expressive part of the, of the ride up on the stage and in rehearsal, it just made so much sense. And and, and I've, I've spent the last almost 40 years <coughs> trying to really speak articulately a well about it, and you can see that I, I can't still. It's such a feeling. It's, it's just something that, that uh, transformed and changed me. And I watched the people around me being changed by it. I went on, um, Kelly and I 
were put up on stage one day in a double duel, and we didn't know what that was about, and <laughs> we fought it out to the end, sweating and getting pushed and getting yelled at, and in the best sense. And afterwards, I was like, oh, poor me, and Bondo said, you know, well, fuck you. <laughs> you. You got to work up there and go through that. It, what was, we didn't realize at the time is we were being auditioned for uh, the roles in Dionysus. And I was to replace uh, the actor playing Agave in his production of the Bacchae, which is entitled Dionysus. We went on, we premiered in Mito, Japan, and, um, and for many reasons, and I did not appreciate it at the time as a young, tall, loud, all engine, not a lot of breaks at that time, <laughs> actor, American actor, holding the head of Pentheus in a Japanese ensemble. And if you know what Agave has to do is she has to look at what she's done and come to the realization that she's murdered her son and ripped his head off. This political context for an American looking at what they've done to Japan, I didn't understand at the time. Um, but I later did. Uh, we went on to tour that play for approximately 18 years uh, all over the world. And subsequently, I entered into the company on a regular basis and divided my time as best I could <clears throat> somewhere over the Pacific Ocean uh, would put on my city t-shirt <laughs> 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 yeah, on my Scott t-shirt. Uh, so that, that's a little bit of the story. I'm a tie. tie. I gave my time to Tommy. <laughs> so at, at that time, um, you know, it, as people got bit by this bug, what you had to do was get over there for the summer. Yeah. Um, and then a, a moment arrived for the next generation of people where they did not have to go over there. Yeah. Um, can you, Sandy, maybe you're the best to, so can you talk about, well, the, you know, what was that tipping point and then how did the, how did the spread of the training in the U.S. Yeah. occur? Um, after that day in that warehouse, I resolved two things, that it was, uh, it was imperative to me that this was available in the training programs, the major ones in the country, and it was imperative to me that the professional theater was at the very least exposed to I mean, we're so insular and we're so uh, American-centric that we're just unaware of almost anything. And here was something that could make such an extraordinary contribution to what people I loved were giving their lives to and falling so short of what was possible. But can I ask you indelicately, yeah. how old were you at that time? I was 26. So wasn't that just crazy? Yeah. Yeah, but you see, when you're 26, you know everything. <laughs> and, and you are quite sure that you know everything, and, and therefore, uh, I was unstoppable about it. I, I, uh, I, contact, I, I flew to New York and uh, spent an afternoon with Michael Langham and uh, tried, I had this video cassette of the Trojan women. And Explain to people who might not remember. Who <laughs> might not. Oh, sorry. Michael had, Michael, well, a video cassette. A video cassette, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Do you remember 8 track? Uh, anyway, Michael had been the uh, artistic director at Guthrie, and upon completing that job, he became the head of the Juilliard Drama Division. And I, I had apprenticed with him and, and knew him. And, and uh, anyway, I did my very best to explain why I thought it was so essential that this, the Juilliard have this company and Juilliard institute this training. And he would, couldn't have been more polite and more gracious and less interested. And then I went to Yale and had a similar meeting with Bob Brustein. 
And, you know, I, I had all my relationship chips. You know, you, when you're 26 and you, you, you can get away with some things based on knowing people. And they were polite. And I, I didn't, I was a very poor communicator, I think, of, of what was possible. And uh, none of the places I went had much interest. And then I had uh, the speech teacher from uh, Juilliard was a man named Timothy Monick. And Tim had been a classmate of mine at Carnegie and a colleague when we both taught there. And I arranged for him to do a master class for two weeks at our school. And I made sure it was the two weeks, this was my plot, uh, when uh, Suzuki-san and, and his actors were in residence. At that, that was a couple of years later, and at that point, we'd send our whole class to Toga in the summer each time. And uh, anyhow, Tim responded exactly as I knew anyone would if they were actually got a chance to be in the presence of the thing instead of a VHS of the thing. And, and then he arranged for it to, for Suzuki-san to work a little bit at uh, Juilliard and then Yale kind of had to and then NYU sort of had to and and uh, then there was so and then Peter Zeisler uh, I, I invited Peter to come to Milwaukee to see the Trojan women which he couldn't because we only had a couple of performances but he he did come and see the training and uh, he got really excited about what was possible and, and Ann spoke last night about that trip that she was invited to, to Toga. And Peter was, like a, a lot of the people who made this stuff happen, a, a force, you say a force of nature, like Katrina, a force of nature, could wipe out whole paradigms and perspectives with a single remark. You know, this man who had started the Guthrie Theater, who had started TCG, and brought this. I mean, just, you know, anyhow. Um, so at that point, I, I had a, I had kind of gotten that ball rolling, so and, and it had a life of its own. And then people like Kelly, Ellen, uh, a great many members of the city company at Mark became. Uh, they had Mr. Suzuki's uh, permission, and and more than that, his empowerment to teach others, and and then it really became you know. I remember the first time I was auditioning for a production I was directing at the alley, and I got a resume, and it said Suzuki training under you know next to juggling and <laughs> driving, and God knows what actors put on those things, and I I, I, I was so startled because there had been this you know, and I, I at that point I knew well that's good if it's now a special skill that people have right next to juggling. I know this has a future. <laughs> Along those lines, <laughs> when it was first introduced to <coughs> Juilliard, Yale, NYU, and so on, what was the nature of that? Was that like sort of you know a four-week workshop in yeah, January it, or less than four weeks? It was much like yeah, I think it was a, an initial week at Juilliard, and I think the same at Yale. I think Suzuki came, and Suzuki came. He he had been with us in Milwaukee, and then so it wasn't so very far to uh, you know to go from Milwaukee to New York. It's, a lot less than Toga to anywhere. And why did he need to come for that, for a one week introductory? I, I don't, you'd have to ask him, here's my interpretation and guess. I think he always, his vision is so large and the contribution he intends to make is so large, I think he was always seeking an opportunity not for fame or for any of that, but for an opportunity to influence and, and have a dialogue between cultures. And so when those opportunities were made available to him, I've never seen him say no. You know, Ellen said last night about the, the yes when he was invited here. It doesn't surprise me at all. You know, I, I asked him when we moved our training program from the University of Wisconsin to the University of Delaware, I asked him would he come and direct the first play there, and he said yes. I think that's a combination of a large vision that wants to be available and something that I, I don't hear when people talk about him but it is very deeply my experience a remarkable kindness a life-altering generosity 
that reaches into you beyond cynicism, beyond rationality, and touches something so human and so basic by its sheer big-heartedness. And I think that's why he did all this. So at this point of time, it was a regular part of your program. Oh, yes. I, I mean, if, you know, Absolutely. semester after semester. But were there Every other, day. Were there yeah. other schools where... Not that to that extent, became... initially. Then, ultimately, yes, no, but not for quite a while. Um, it, and what it, were the first next one? Uh, University of California, San Diego. Uh, a, a very gifted former student of, of ours named Steve Pearson uh, and his, his uh, partner, now wife, Robin Hunt, uh, went there, got the possibility, I think, and got very committed to bringing it there. And I believe that was the next training program where it became intrinsic. And now, where, what are the training programs where it's intrinsic? I don't In know. the US, are there any? Um, I don't know. Well, some of you may represent them out there. Um, I teach at the Juilliard School and have now for eight, Jesus, 18 years. And uh, it's, it's... Heart skips a beat when you say a that. A little bit. I know, I know. I'm bit. <laughs> and they thoroughly em embraced it along with their classical European approach. Well, UCLA. UCLA? CCF. Great. CCF. Thank you. Yeah. University of Washington. Yeah, shout it out, y'all. Yeah, shout it out. You're sure in the room. And I'm sure the Island University. Yeah, and I'm sure the University of South Carolina where Stephen and Robin are. Right. Where did the where Atlanta Kelly teach? The Atlanta. I was in NYU. Was it NYU? University of Houston. Wow. That's great. Carnegie Mellon, yeah. And so this, I, I'm talking about like sort of on, you know, it's really, daily, right. it's not just we're going to do this for two weeks, yeah. like really part of the training. Fantastic. City <laughs> Conservatory. <laughs> so it, it, it's definitely <clears throat> Johnny Appleseed around the country. Around yeah. Country and, and, and certainly the city company ha has, over the last 25 years, seeded many, well, many communities all over the world um, and have consistent relationships with the National Theater in Helsinki and, and other programs. Tom, you don't teach. I, I don't. I haven't been. No, I just, I don't. <laughs> just exactly, I only act. I'm very selfish with the training. No, but I just, I recently read a quote by Dag Hammershaw that said, maturity is the sort of willingness to um, share your knowledge and, and, you know, be quality, you know, and I thought, oh, geez, maybe it's time for me to share my knowledge, so. <laughs> Anybody's looking for an instructor. I think. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> yeah, you know, Megan mentioned, but Ellen, can you talk for a few minutes about how the new city conservatory is a maybe kind of a next stage in. I will, yeah. Let me just for one minute though yeah, say please. that when, when uh, I'll speak for myself, when I came back, I was still a member of the Milwaukee Rep and I was a member of the regional theater system. I would go every summer to train and come back and do a season of plays, which always included Christmas Carol. Except for Scrooge. So it, what, what motivated us to teach, or at that time we didn't call it teaching, it was just showing people what we were doing so that we could keep doing it. And we went down in the spaces that were available in these regional theater buildings. They were cement basements. And we built platforms with the old lumber from sets. I mean, this sounds like you had to kill what you ate, but yeah, kind of. I just kind of like that. Yeah, yeah. And, and put on like three pairs of socks and went down. And one time we had the upper floor above a bank that they gave us the building, but we could only use it from 6 a.m. to 9. So before a full day of rehearsal and performance at night, we went and we drank from 7.15 to 8. 15 or something like that every morning mm -hmm. in Milwaukee 
And little by little, more and more people, particularly the intern company at that time, and then suddenly we were in charge of the intern company, and then suddenly, and then I moved to the East Coast, and we ran a full young company at that time. So there was a natural progression this way. Um, I moved into New York and began teaching. Also, along the road, Suzuki was turning to me and saying, oh, you, 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 you're you, going to teach this. And the first time I taught in front of the company was in the Teatro Olimpico in Vicenza, Italy, <laughs> in front of my, my teachers. And he said, no, I, I want the skinny American girl. <laughs> and the audience was so disappointed. You know, they really, <laughs> they really, they, every time I get off an airplane to teach on behalf of Scott, they were waiting for Yoda. You know, they wanted the road, <laughs> the staff, and the long beard. And, you know, this chick got off the plane like, hey, where, what kind of money do you use? And, <laughs> and then we would teach because the underlying message there is, of course, the, book, the uniqueness of the vocabulary and that it is a personal encounter with something. And if uh, well laid out, and Suzuki felt as I progressed that I was able to do that and bridge being inside of Scott and bridge something to the outside, so to speak, world, as any world is outside of a company. And, and I became very much in charge of that for, on his behalf. It was super fun. <laughs> and it's only, you know, as Tom said, it's only through articulating what it is you're experiencing that you learn what you're experiencing. And, and then meeting my colleagues and we formed and continue to this day to be in each other's classes and go, wow, I never thought of it that way over 40 years. So that's a little bit of part. Which led, leads me to the answer of your question, which is the City Conservatory, which was formed a, a dream quite a while ago uh, maybe six, seven, seven years ago, where we were getting frustrated and, and thinking there was something beyond the seven week encounter with an artist, the four week intensive, and we wanted a longer term relationship and we took the plunge and we created a conservatory program that lasts for nine months. Uh, and, and in the spirit of Scott, it, it continues to be, as does the summer intensive, a, a reckoning and a, a place to come, a, a, a gathering place for international artists to exchange, to drink together, to sit together, to eat together, um, to argue together, and ultimately to make work together that is unique and could not happen in any other um, realm. And it is only through meeting the other that you, again, transform the self. So, the conservatory was formed. We just completed our third. We do it every other year. Um, it, it, it kicks the liver and lights out of us in some way. And, but it's also our way of renewing ourselves. City hasn't gone on to, at, up to this point, bring in younger members. We're always asked about that. You'll probably ask us later about that. So the conservatory was the start of answering that question. Well, we perhaps won't make a city 2.0, but what we are doing is we're planting gardens all over the world through these, uh, our contact with these artists. And it's profoundly changing us because we continue to run our company and tour and make new work and perform and uh, teach other residencies. So it's a tall order. But again, we have this model of these people that were how, how, how can you be building that set over there and you just cooked me my dinner and now you're playing Andromache. drama key. How is that working? How did, why are you vacuuming my room? Stop that! <laughs> Do that! And that, I mean, if you've even felt the essence of those cats walking around the campus, it's just their goodness, their kindness, who comes, uh, comes down from their, their remarkable um, Suzuki Tadashi leading them. So um, that, that's a little bit about the city conservatory. Mm -hmm. um, let me just uh, inject. I saw on, I'm not uh, in any way part of this history, 
Um, but I saw last night on social media, Donnie, was it you who posted um, about an American who was part of this history and there was a memorial gathering? Charles. Oh. Mm -hmm. um, and um, do you want to talk about him for a minute and people like that who sort of came into this orbit of Americans who were performing in the productions at various stages? He, he, he was in Lear with you. He right? was. He was. Charles Tuthill. <sighs> Sorry. Uh, we were in a production of uh, Tadashi Suzuki's Tale of Lear, which is a kind of a deconstruction and recompilation of, of King Lear. And Charles was my beautiful and very heavy Cordelia. <laughs> 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 Uh, a really, really sweet man, and his passing is a shock. And, and uh, but that was, uh, I, I'll speak briefly about that production. Uh, it was an all-male production. Uh, Suzuki first produced it with an all-male cast, and it was kind of a remarkable and history-making production in the United States. Mark Corkins was also in the production, uh, all-American, and we all of the actors in it represented different regional theaters. And help me with this, Mark. Stage West in Springfield, Arena Stage in Washington, D.C., the Berkeley Repertory Theater, and the Milwaukee Repertory Theater. Is yes, that correct? Sir. So yes. all of us represented those theaters, and we had. And when was this approximately? When was this? I turned 30, so it was like 1990. Yeah. 1988? 88. 88. 88. 88. Yeah. 88. 30 years old, I'm playing Lear. So. Uh, <laughs> Uh, when we had residences, we, we, we started in Milwaukee right. and then moved, to, we were there for, you know, like a, a part of their subscription series and we moved to Berkeley right. and Stage West and Washington, D.C. So we, you know, it was, uh, and they're all work contracts and it, it was like a, a, the first co-pro, uh, I think, of that kind of thing. So um, Charles was, was part of that and part of that kind of historical thing and, and it was the first time an all-American production a Suzuki production had been done in the United States. It's really had all of those people trained in Japan? Yes, to varying degrees. Yeah, we, uh, yeah, we, we all came to Japan and trained and rehearsed the show there. Yeah, the loss of Charles is pretty significant and, and we are still a little bit in shock. Did any of you know Charles? Ran the uh, Actors Center recently. Um, again, one of like Tom, like my colleagues in the city company, just these, these incredibly warm people that found one another and went that, you know, I, I need yeah. you in my life, I need to work with you, and Suzuki made that possible. Suzuki was attracted to it um, and set us up. Most, many of us met, met of city, were together in Hoga and, and encountering Charles and having friendships with them, and then City came after that. So there was a time, although you were only in your mid-twenties, but when you were encountering and teaching younger people, and older, yeah. you were saying to them, well, you have to get over to Toga for the summer. Yeah. What, and we made it, we, what so do you we say to people now? Too. It wasn't quite as, you know, I mean, we paid for it and covered it, and, but the the you know the 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 highway at that time yeah. was you know you have to get yourself over there. What form does mentorship take now? Where do you send people? I don't and I don't have a conservatory any longer, so I tell people to come to the city company. And but I'm not asked that frequently because I'm just not in that business anymore. But you come in contact with young people still? I do, yeah. Increasingly, everybody and don't they is ask in that category. <laughs> <laughs> where where yes. do I go? What yeah. do I do? Yeah. Where and, should I train? And I, I, I'm thrilled to know about this city conservatory because the only thing I've known to say to people other than go to Togemura is to come here in the summer to Skidmore. I think that's a giant opportunity to be able to be with you for nine months. It's unprecedented. There, and so, you, and I mean, you must talk to young actors a lot and do those. Yes, as people know, raising their hands. Broadway con type. <laughs> yeah, right. 
No, I, I'm realizing as I sit here how often I will, you know, people say, well, what have you done? And I'll see Suzuki on my resume and say, I, oh, I, done, I know the training, you know, I know the training. It's, it happens all, yeah. all the time. It's astonishing, when, you know, uh, rarely do I meet people who are young actors who are fresh from conservatories have not encountered Mr. Suzuki's training. Yeah. yeah, and he does, and reinstated, there was a break there for a while. I, I taught his summer program for many years, and then there was a break, and then mm -hmm. he reinstated it. And there is, I believe, what is it, Melissa, two weeks? Yeah, two, and a half. two and a half weeks in Toga. Um, a, a pretty rigorous selection process, but he's reinstated that to bring, uh, not just actors, certainly, he's very, very interested in directors and feels that training directors is a critical uh, purpose right now of that program. And, and you know, it, it is two different things, you know, when we train people we're training in New York in our studio, which is a, a New York studio. It's limited view out the window and the light leaves by noon and um, it, it has its uh, parameters. When you train in toga, you know, your, your body, your sensibilities are experiencing a whole different aspect of the magnitude of what that training is and, and the sense of fiction born of, of an intensity we rarely see, and when we see it, we rarely see actors who can control it, um, except for the extraordinary gypsies on Broadway, that kind of mastery of their energy. But in, in a place such as King Lear, or in a place such as a Chekhov play, where the intensity is so outside of a, a daily understanding of how to project that outside of a psychological reality, we don't know what to do with that. And Suzuki's inquiry into that certainly does not come strictly out of being a Japanese artist. By any means, it's a completely unique phenomenon in the world. And this is important to continue to lead young generations into and show them the opportunity. Like you, you so beautifully talked about. You went in, you stood up, you were different, and you suddenly saw a way of doing the plays you'd always wanted to do and didn't know how to do them because a, a psychological, realistic approach doesn't answer those questions thoroughly. Not that it is in place of, simply that the container is able to run at a pretty high RPM and get it out with a, a ferocity to the audience that we're missing from the vitality of Wow. We have we have fifteen <laughs> minutes. So we have fifteen minutes left and I want to use that time for your questions. Ali, have we had any online? Okay, then in the room. Um, let me just ask for the purposes of the live feed, can people just stand up and shout? Will the will the question get picked up or do we need to repeat it? Repeat. Okay. Yes. Um, hi, it's Rick Eva. Um, Ellen, I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about the focus that Suzuki has on training directors? Well, I think he, uh, he certainly believes that a director vision, it's obvious the connections and the value for an actor's body and spirit and voice. It's, it's an integrated training system, as, as you know, body voice metaphysical, physical, but that um, that for a director to understand the range that an artist can go, the, the, uh, the, the level of discourse that a director can have with a performance, the ability to conceive of a fictional space and a structure to that space. As Tom said, his structure is really very simple he gives it to you. My first rehearsal was he gave me a mannequin head and a giant 40-foot costume <laughs> and shut me in a sound room where people practice violin for eight hours alone. And it was like, oh, okay, oh, make, make agave. That, that he had the fortitude because 
his understanding of, of the structure and his own mise-en-scene and the criteria that he was setting up is so clear and it's never wavered off point. That's the other thing. I think Sebastian talks so beautifully about it in the Daco. It's a compass. And wherever you go, that compass. And, and to, to have young directors understand that it's that compass point that they can develop and must through, through their vision, through their, um, their, their discipline and their command of their own aesthetic. That, that the training then gives them a language to create that into time and space. It gives them a way of communicating. It gives them a broader sense of the definition of what theater can be. Yeah. That, um, that we really, in some ways, directors are, are the gateway for the actor to do what it is that we need to do, which is, as Anne would say, direct our role, and the director needs to direct the, the event. Ellen was referring in passing to a, a video <coughs> that's been a documentary video on the sort of life of the company um, uh, at Toga, and which we viewed yesterday, and I think is available to people online. Um, either, I, I believe Scott has a YouTube channel, and of course they also have a website. And I think that video, which was produced by them, yes. um, is available on, in those places. And it's certainly something that people, and this is relatively new. That, yes, it is. It, it, it is. So uh, it's not the old one that people may have seen in years past. Um, uh, yes, the, that's the other thing. Sandy just reminded me there is also another thing Suzuki, among the many things, that he's just constantly innovating. And, and really uh, putting his force behind the young generation. You have to understand, at least in Japan, the, the regional theater system did not really exist at all until Mr. Suzuki came to understand the system in the United States, partly through people like Sanford Robbins and, and Sarah Tonin O'Connor went back and began to seed and create these theaters all over Japan that were a replica model of regional theaters. He now has created a director's festival in Toga where he selects three different scripts. The directors select that script. They do one of the three. They present it in front of a panel of critics and scholars and academics so that they get feedback and then the winning uh, the winner is announced at the end of the summer, and what they win is a full support of their next production. So it's, it's just so humane and <laughs> brilliant that you get to sit down after your show and have a beer and, and, and get feedback, and you're in toga learning and, and doing your work. It, it's an amazing system. So again, the, the, his investment into not only actors, but directors and writers is boundless, maybe boundless. Yeah, John Gillespie of uh, New York City. Uh, I've been interested in intercultural borrowing for years. Uh, you know, why, why take it from another culture and use it in your own? And uh, in, in every case that I've uh, looked into, there, they, there is the borrowing, and there's a period of awkwardness, and it doesn't really seem like the original. And then there's a internalizing it, making it your own, and there's some changes along the way. So question to you folks. Uh, ways, if any, has Suzuki training been modified by its long use now in the United States and, in fact, in the Western world? Mm. A wonderful question. Um, None intentionally. That, that's my no, answer. No, no, that, no, no, but as you say, no. it's inevitable. So, yeah. but I, I believe that people do their, ver their utmost to prevent that phenomenon in the face of the fact that it's inevitable. So I don't know that we're so very aware of that. I, I, I'm not at any rate. I, I think one of the things is each culture is so unique to itself. And perhaps Suzuki would talk about it. He did a little bit over at the Martin Siegel Center 
which is many different cultures carry their bodies and their center of gravities in a different relationship to the earth, um, be them from an agrarian culture or not, highly technical culture such as our own. And that's a different use of the body. And we, we, we do, in the United States, have a strong, um, in, a, in our theater training, European tradition. And frankly, he loved that. He loved that collision that happened and, and encouraged it and encourages the Russian company that to this day is doing that training and, and performing King Lear at the Moscow Art that they, that, they, that they personalize it and that artistic maturation really comes from personalizing the training. That doesn't mean that the, the guiding principles of it, the, the core, and he's gone on very recently to really articulate the six kind of core exercises that, that remain constant so that you can fluctuate and, and, and move around, but the criteria is very, very firmly set out. So I would say, yes, it, it does change. It changes for every single body in this room that does it. And it should feature your own individual uniqueness. It doesn't mean that the criteria changes. It doesn't change, right? And that just makes us fail, fail again, and fail better, <laughs> so to speak. Samuel Beck. Um, at the back, and then I'll come to you. All right, this is Daniel, I'm a school security leader. I just want to follow up on that, Ellen. Um, because I've seen so many people use the training in so many different places, and certainly there are times at which the, the rigor or things that seem essential to me start to drop away completely for a very specific purpose. Oh, this is going to be useful in this scene or something, and I can pull my hair out. Uh, <laughs> but I wonder if you could articulate what the, what the, what the core essence of this needs to be there as the work is translated. Can anybody talk to, you know, these are the absolute essentials that need to go into the work? Um, control of your center of gravity, control of an excessive amount of energy, okay, and control of your breathing. Those kind of three criteria which are necessary to function in daily life are necessary for expressive purposes on the stage. In daily life, you can't think about those three things or you'll go bonkers. <laughs> on the stage, you have, we have to train ourselves to bring those to the forefront so that they become instinctual, that those, those are the, the three things that you are really looking at, out of which stems the self and transformation. That, that's as quick as that. And then, you know, see me in about 45 minutes. <laughs> but I think you understand. What, what's, what I think Mr. Suzuki, and I, I don't like speaking for him, <clears throat> but what I think he would encourage is that what creeps him out and skeezes him a little bit is when he sees it, when he sees outside of his own company, people trying to replicate a, 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 I don't know, even know the, how to say this. The cosmetics a, of it. The, the, the an, exotic, yeah. an exoticizing yeah. of the work and a, a, a hanging on to the Japanese yeah. aspect of it and, and um, um, really trying to be that and, and, a, and there's a gruffness to it that's mistaken and a, and a sort of hierarchy, hierarchy, a hierarchical structure in the room that's a little mistaken oftentimes and a tone that he's like, well, what are you, what are you doing there? <laughs> um, you know, his work, his relationship with his actors is his, what, what they do, what they, they created together and is a contract that nobody in here, including myself, thoroughly understands. It's theirs. Um, and, and that is so often, the container of it is so often mistaken and simply taken and placed rather than the content and the essence of that. We have five minutes left. Maybe this is our last question, maybe not. Start, you know, 
wonderfully. You get a pair of Tobby, <laughs> and you invite someone who is sufficiently masterful to support you, and you don't stop until what you are after has been achieved, and it never will be, so you won't stop. <laughs> Okay, well maybe that's <laughs> a perfect place to end. Um, thank you all. This is, for people who are watching online, this is the first uh, session of um, two and a half very full days. Um, some of these sessions will be uh, live streamed. And uh, the next one of those is coming up tomorrow, I'm told. Um, but meanwhile, just so you're aware, there, is, um, there are training sessions going on here, which of course are not going to be live streamed, um, but that's what we will be doing between now and the next time we see you online. And then um, this weekend, on Friday and Saturday nights, there are performances here in Saratoga Springs, New York, of the uh, Scott Company's Trojan Women, um, which is a production that is now 40 years old? Yeah. Uh, uh, something that we in the States rarely, rarely get to see. Yeah. Uh, a repertory company that has held a production, you know, in, intact for 40 years. Um, that still has the power that it had, you know, at any point along the, the route. And uh, so if you are within train or car or any kind of distance of Saratoga Springs, New York, and you can get here this weekend on Friday or Saturday nights, and I don't know how long you'll have to line up to try to get into that theater, it's not a big theater, but um, you should try to do it. Okay, thank you. Thank you.